Welcome to the Global Virtual Lecture Hall. Welcome to the Shanghai Lectures. I see that I have an initial uh, problem here, which is not unusual. Welcome to the Shanghai Lectures. Today we will be broadcasting from Shanghai Jiao Tong University. And to help a bit with the geography, for those who are not so familiar with the geography of China, you can see Shanghai is uh, over over here, where this arrow is pointing. So over here you have Thailand, you have India, we have Korea, and we have Japan over here. And here is Shanghai in the middle. Okay. So. This is uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University when we started in 2009 with the Shanghai Lectures. The auditorium today, we're in a small uh, meeting room. And next week, uh, Professor Wei Dong Chen, who is the host of the Shanghai Lectures here in uh, Shanghai, will briefly introduce Shanghai Jiao Tong University, especially the Department of Engineering and the Robotics Laboratory. He missed his plane. He was at the conference in Montreal in Canada. He missed his plane. It was going to arrive yesterday, but he will only arrive tonight. So we postponed that to next week. Now I will be calling on, as announced, I will be calling on uh, these sites here with specific questions. So, but please do speak up at any time when you have a question. You know, just uh, grab the microphone, switch it on, and ask your question. Today we'll talk about towards the theory of intelligence, and we will have a highlight uh, with uh, uh, Alex Weibel showing the most advanced speech processing and translation system. He will give a guest lecture right after uh, I finish here. So this is what we're going to do today. So let me start with a short recap from last time. We talked about the classical approach to uh, artificial intelligence, cognition as computation. We looked at some of the failures and successes. You know, you take uh, search engines or the game of chess, extremely successful, manufacturing, extremely successful, and then we looked at some of the problems fundamental problems of the classical approach, which are, you know, symbol grounding problem, frame problem, the homunculus problem, and we also argued why we need an embodied approach. And remember our Wolpert's quote, why do plants not have brains? And there we looked at the fact that during, onto, uh, during the uh, evolution, natural evolution, what we now call cognition or intelligence has always evolved as part of a complete organism that had to interact with the real world, survive in the real world, and reproduce in the real world. Then um, we mentioned that the Rodney Brooks from MIT is basically the one who sort of started this embodied term, uh, turn, what you might call the embodied turn in uh, artificial intelligence. And let me just briefly uh, go through this. I think this is uh, very, very interesting from a uh, perspective of embodied intelligence. So single cell entities arose out of the primordial soup roughly 3.5 billion years ago. A billion years passed before photosynthetic plants appeared. After almost another billion and a half of years, around 550 million years ago, the first fish and vertebrates came into being, and 100 million years ago, later, uh, 100 million years later, insects emerged. So let us quote directly from Brooks's argument. Then things started moving really fast. Reptiles arrived 370 million years ago, followed by dinosaurs 330, and mammals at 250 million years ago. The first primates appeared 120 million years ago, 
and the immediate predecessors to the great apes a mere 18 million years ago. Man arrived in roughly his present form two, only 2.5 million years ago. He invented agriculture a mere 19,000 years ago, writing less than 5,000 years ago, and expert knowledge, what we, uh, what we call it today, only over the last few hundred years. So you can see there is an enormous speed up of evolution over time. Now Brooks's argument is that it took insects a really long time to come about. So coming from zero, so to speak, to insects was the really hard task, whereas coming from insects up to human beings which was the much, much easier task as documented by the time it took during evolution, which was much, much shorter then from nothing to insects, and so he argued, we should really, we should really study insects if you really want to understand intelligence. Okay, we'll come back to this topic when we uh, look at evolution. But I thought this is interesting background information for everyone to know. If we don't understand how intelligence has evolved, we don't know what it is and we don't know how it functions. Okay. So last time we looked at this famous, notorious frame of reference problem. Now it's an entirely obvious problem, and uh, so you might ask, why am I making a big fuss about it? If you look at the literature, you will immediately find out that there is great confusion about it. But let's go quickly go through it. This is taken from Herbert Simon, one of the founders of artificial intelligence, from his very famous book, The Sciences of the Artificial, which was published, I think, in the 1970s by MIT Press. So he said, well, let's look at an ant. You know, there's a food source, and uh, the ant is moving back to the nest. And what we see, what we observe, is a very complex trajectory in the behavior of the ant. Now, then he argues, well, maybe the complexity of this behavior is not in the brain inside the insect, but maybe the insect is equipped with very simple behavioral rules, like if there is an obstacle on the left, turn right. If there is an obstacle on the right, turn left. Otherwise, go straight. And then you get this uh, actually complex behavior from simple behavioral rules. Now, maybe we can quickly switch to Chiba, and you can briefly talk about where the complexity in the behavior, or the apparent behavior is from. So, with someone from Chiba, uh, <laughs> Okay. Uh, I think uh, um, I think it is coming from an interaction with environment or real world, uh, such that ants find new way to avoid obstacles on each occasion that obstacles uh, appeared. Right. Okay. So now, why don't we just just leave uh, Chiba there? Uh, we have uh, we, we're going to make a thought experiment which is biologically maybe unrealistic, but uh, let's go through it quickly anyhow. So if we increase the body by a factor of 1,000 of the insect, but we leave everything else the same, we leave the behavioral rules the same, we leave the environment exactly the same, so everything the same except except the body size. So what's hap what, what happens, maybe Chiba again, What's happening to the uh, behavior of the ant? What's the new path? Okay. Uh, uh, I think a big ant will go straight to this nation because there is no obstacle for it. Right. Okay. That's exactly uh, right. So it will be, I think, the path. Let me see if I can draw this, probably not very well. It will be much more straight than before because what used to be obstacles for the ant 
are no longer uh, obstacles for the big end, okay? And mind you, the complexity, as you were saying correctly, the complexity of the behavior does not come from the environment only. It comes from the interaction of the insect with the environment. Okay, and this is the fa famous frame of reference problem. There is a perspectives issue. Am I talking about the perspective of the agent? What does the world look like from the ant's point of view? Am I talking about my perspective? And then the behavior versus mechanism. I observe a possibly complex behavior, but maybe the mechanisms that bring the behavior about are very simple, and then there is a complexity issue. You know, complex behavior from simple mechanisms. Okay, and then, you know, we said that we're going to have this competition about the frame of reference problem. Right. Okay, and then, the, so I think this is, this is uh, the recap from last time. And what I would now like to do is maybe switch to Xi'an. Is Xi'an connected? Actually, maybe not, huh? Not done? Yeah, yes, it seems that uh, Xi'an hasn't connected so far, so maybe we have to postpone this until they're connected. Let's, let's postpone this. Yep. This is no problem. So uh, uh, let us briefly continue with this issue of the frame of reference problem. Now there is a, a beautiful book by uh, Valentino Breitenberg, a neuroscientist, and it's called Vehicles. And these vehicles are now called the Breitenberg Vehicles. It's a very simple type, a very simple type of vehicles. And I'm not going to go through this. I just mentioned the basics. Please read about the Breitenberg vehicles in your notes. So we have a lot of notes, a lot of detail uh, that you can find out. And the idea, basic idea is you just have a vehicle. You have a sensor. You have a motor. And the sensor is for a particular quality, maybe temperature or some chemical concentration. And then there is one wire connecting the sensor to the motor. And the more you get from this quantity, the faster the motor will go. So if it gets brighter, the vehicle will move faster. Or if the chemical concentration of something gets higher, the, the vehicle will move faster, or vice versa. And then he makes these vehicles more complex. He makes these vehicles more complex. And then he can get very sophisticated or seemingly sophisticated behaviors from very simple uh, designs. So please uh, read about that. Okay. What I would like to do next is again exercise a bit this issue of observed behavior and internal underlying mechanisms. So maybe not on, we can have the uh, DidaBots video. So DidaBots stands for didactical robots, a very simple kind of robot. OK, can we? Ah, here we go, yes. Can you play the video from the beginning? Yes, oh, OK, thank you. Okay, right, thank you. So maybe we can, uh, so you've seen the, the video, so you've seen these robots, you know, doing something. Now can we briefly switch to Budapest? So uh, could you comment briefly on what we've just seen? What? What? Uh, 
have any hypothesis about what the robot might be doing here? Can you hear me? <coughs> yes. Do you hear us? Yeah, we can. So yep. there was one robot which uh, went towards the direction of the other two robots, bumped into them, went away, went back, and then the two other ones followed the first one. I didn't quite understand. It was the sound is very unclear. I didn't quite understand what you were saying. The sound was very uh, unclear. Can you repeat, uh, maybe? Budapest, could you maybe sit closer to the microphone? Yeah. I think you have to get closer to the so, microphone, otherwise... Uh, it said that the, the robots were bonding and then they were following each other. Okay. They were following each other. Okay. Why were they following each other? On the basis of what? Can you elaborate that? Why were they following each other? What was what might be the mechanism for the for the following? Well, maybe something in connection with light. Exactly. So all of the robots have on top a light source, right? A light bulb, and so basically they were following the light. Now there were okay. I think that's exactly what's what's happening. And we saw these robots stuck against the wall, right? There were two robots stuck against the wall, and there was a third one coming on and basically freaked them, you know, hit them so that they could get away from the wall. So it looks as if the third robot was helping the first two getting away from the wall, right? Now, so it looks as if the third robot was helping them, even though the internal mechanism is only the light following mechanism. I think we can see it here, so I Nathan is playing the video again. Now the reason it goes here is because there are two light sources. Now it's hitting and because following a light source it's coming back and then they get away from them. So it's only light following. That's the only thing that's happening here. But it looks like helping behavior. So thank you, Budapest. I think that's uh, a good interpretation. Okay, let's continue a bit with these very simple robots. So this, they're called the Swiss robots. You will see in a minute why they're called the Swiss robots. So let's look at the robot experiment. So this is an arena with boards. There, so there are walls around the arena. It's about six by six meters filled randomly with styrofoam cubes. We put the robots in there and we let them work. So what's happening over time is this. Each frame is about two to three minutes. So the whole thing takes about roughly 20 minutes, right? Okay, now uh, we can do a, a wake-up exercise maybe in Salford because they are here very early. It's only past 8, right? 8 o'clock. Can we briefly switch to Salford for a comment on what the robots are actually doing? Yeah. Now oh, we can't hear you. Can you switch on the sound? We can't hear you. Can you switch on the sound? Okay, so maybe we'll, uh, we'll, uh, or maybe, maybe we just have the local audience here in Shanghai. What are the robots doing? Uh, clustering, yeah, they're forming clusters. Other. Other suggestions? Okay, I have a few answers here. They're actually uh, forming clusters, they're moving the cubes together, or one student once said they're actually making free space, you know, so that they can move better, you know, don't have to move in a cluttered environment. And my favorite interpretation is they're cleaning up, and because 
the Swiss are known to be very neat, clean people. You know, they like to clean things. They're called now uh, the Swiss robots. Now, going back to the frame of reference problem, we have a clear observer's perspective here. So that's what we see as an outside observer, right? They're cleaning up, they're making clusters. Now, if we look at the internal mechanism, so what are the robots really doing? Now, let's see what the standard solution would uh, look like. So if you have a collection task like this one, you know, collecting the cubes, and then I had the Shanghai as uh, can someone here maybe explain? And I will repeat the, the, the thing for, for the global audience. Can someone explain what normally for a collection task you would expect the robots to be able to do? For a standard collection task, what, what would you have to do? Right, so first thing you have to do is you have to recognize the object that you should collect, right, obviously. Second, pardon me? Yeah. Right, so basically you have to move up to the object that you want to collect. And the third thing? I mean, just moving up is not enough. What do you also have to do? You have to pick it up somehow, right? And then the third thing, you have to, right, you have to know where to deposit it. So basically you have to find the cluster if there is one. And then you, you have to deposit the object, right? So these are all, and so many let's say, sophisticated skills have to be in place for this task to be successful, okay? Recognition, which can be difficult, then you have to move up to the object, you have to grasp the object somehow, you have to find the nearest cluster, which is also a recognition task, and then you have to move to the cluster and deposit the object near the cluster, okay? That's the classical solution. Let's, but let's see, let's see how it goes. Let's see what the, the uh, simple solution is. So over here, we have uh, over here we have the uh, robot, which has two IR sensors here, and let's see what's happening. The behavioral rule is as uh, follows. If there is sensory stimulation on left, turn right. If there is sensory stimulation on right turn left. So that's the actual behavioral rule that we programmed into these robots. So they're basically programmed for obstacle avoidance. Right? That's the situ what's called the situated perspective. That's called the situated perspective that is what does the world look like? from the agent's perspective. So the agent only sees the two sensory values. The agent doesn't see cubes, it doesn't see an arena, it doesn't see other robots, it only has these two sensory values and that's it. So that's the situated perspective of uh, the agent. But why now do we actually get the clusters? Why do we get the cluster formation? If by chance, the robot happens to encounter a, an obstacle head-on, then it doesn't get sensory stimulation here. It doesn't get sensory stimulation here. So what happens? What happens here, maybe, local? It, it will push it will push the object but not because it wants to push it or because it's programmed to push it but because it doesn't know of its existence right and how far does it push it well let's see 
here it's pushing it until here and then at this point this sensor gets stimulated by this flop here right and then what happens it turns away and now we already have two blocks next to each other and the probability that next time around yet another block will be deposited near the two is increased so you get basically cluster formation from obstacle avoidance okay let's now make a thought experiment and again let's leave everything as is let's leave the environment as is and the behavioral rules as is let's just change one little thing which is this uh, morphology change over here we just move this sensor over here now maybe we can briefly switch to uh, Osaka for a comment on uh, what's happening what's happening what's your uh, suggestion and I think two phenomena will occur. Uh, first, the robot, uh, the robot can, the robot becomes cannot push the object because he avoids the object of uh, words. The second, and uh, he, okay. Uh, the second, he, um, he becomes he cannot. Recognize the, he cannot perceive the left side wall, so he will go along the uh, wall, uh, no longer uh -huh. the object, object okay. uh, exists along the wall. Okay, excellent, very good. So, so we see that if you look at the world from the perspective of the robot, we know what's going to happen, but from the outside, it looks very different. We, ju we only have this very small morphological mod modification, uh, modification of the morphology. So the position of the sensors is part of the morphology of the agent. If we change that, the behavior of the robot is completely changed. Right? It used to clean up or make clusters, and now it doesn't make clusters anymore. But e even though the behavioral rules are the same and the environment is the same and let's summarize quickly I think it's a beautiful illustration of the frame of reference problem we also talk about self-organization or emergence so if you look at the code at the behavioral rules you cannot say what's happening in the environment unless you know what the morphology is of the robot unless you know what the environment is like uh, and unless you know how the control program is embedded into the robot. We also talk about exploitation of the ecological niche, which I will talk about more later when we discuss the principle of cheap design. Okay, just to give you a feel for what it looks like when these uh, robots behave, can we have uh, the video briefly, Nathan? Okay, just so you can see how they how they would move around in there, you know, avoiding obstacles, but occasionally also pushing one of the blocks. Okay, I think that's fine now, Tom. Thank you. All right. Now, so we get uh, a, a quote from Daniel Dennett. I will frequently be mentioning Daniel Dennett, one of my favorite philosophers, philosophy of mind, American philosopher. And he, when he saw this experiment, ah, uh, uh, when he saw this experiment, he said, "These robots are actually cleaning up, but not, that's not what they think they're doing. That's of course a joke, because I mean, if you you don't want to call what these robots are doing thinking, you know, they're just avoiding obstacles. But what he is trying to say is that they're, from our perspective, they are cleaning up." Right? Whereas from the robot's perspective, they are just reacting to sensory stimulation. That's all. Okay? Now, 
let's do another thought experiment. What happens if instead of four or five robots, we only have one robot that we use for the same experiment? Can we briefly switch to Berlin, maybe? Humboldt University? Any volunteers for... Uh... Um, can you hear me? So yes, far? we can, very well. Um, the thing is that when we have just one robot, that there's no influence by other robots, of course, and so the same thing with Tidy Up can maybe take some more time or can stuck in some symmetrics of the world. That would be my exactly. answer. Exactly. I think it's this is perfectly correct. So on the one hand, it just takes longer. But on the other, there is a trade-off that often these robots get stuck somewhere. Now, if there are other robots around that happen to be by chance to be near one of the robots that has gotten stuck, the robot might be freed again. Right, so that overall, if you have several robots, it's more like the chances that they can finish the task is higher than if you just have one robot. And here is just a cartoon from the book, How the Body Shapes the Way You Think. Okay, so uh, now I'm not going to say the fun is over, but now to more serious, we now move to more serious stuff. So prerequisites for a theory of intelligence. So let's look at first what form the theory to take. Now the form of the theory that is not a scientific question but it's basically a question of philosophy of science. There's no way in which you can make an experiment and test but you have certain preferences and some people have a preferences for verbal uh, verbal uh, theories and other people have a preference for mathematical theories and but maybe let's can we briefly switch to Korea to Seoul maybe you can give us an idea of your uh, intuitions about verbal theory versus mathematical what are the pros and cons I mean one two one I have here but maybe What's the advantage uh, of verbal theory? Uh, one uh, pros that I think for the uh, natural language, the verbal, is it has grammar. Do you hear me? Yes, we can. Where, Very well. Yeah, well, uh, when we have, uh, when in verbal we have grammar, so we can manipulate and uh, diversely uh, exploit to communicate and, and make theories. On the other hand, uh, in mathematics, we require some skills to do it. Is that okay? Yeah, that's uh, very okay. I think you mentioned important characteristics. Now, the natural language requires no training, typically, because we've all learned that but it has low precision. You can gloss over detail. It's also, I'm just adding a couple of points, it's also very ambiguous and you know, lack of rigor. Whereas in mathematics, you know, it's very rigorous, but the price you pay for this is that the expressive power, depending on what kind of mathematics you are using, is very limited to this particular formalism that you're using. And so there are pros and cons, and I think we never use just one method. Of course, we will also always be using some mathematics, but we also want verbal descriptions because of the higher expressive power. And then I mentioned here also that there are algorithmic theories. You know, many, many times people, like in GoFi, good old-fashioned artificial intelligence, they use logic, logic-based rules, algorithms, to describe intelligent behavior. Okay, now later on we will be talking about design principles because we not only want to understand intelligence but we want to build intelligent systems. So we use what's called the synthetic methodolo methodology which is understanding by building, uh, understanding 
by building. And so we're trying to figure out a behavior, you know, looking at the end, Simon's end on the beach. We try to build something maybe complex because we observe complex behavior. The design fails and maybe the, the design is actually uh, very simple. Okay, the second aspect that we need to take into account is time perspectives when you formulate a theory. You know, we work towards a theory of intelligence. Now any, let's say, sensible, reasonable theory of intelligence has to deal with three time scales, at least three different time scales. One is the here and now time scale, which is basically what does the system do? How does it function? For example, you are driving in the, in the street, there is a red traffic light, and then you push the brakes. So what are the neural mechanisms and the perceptual mechanisms and the motor mechanisms that make you actually stop? You know, what are the circuits involved in this particular behavior, which is what's happening right now, okay? Then there is what's called the ontogenetic perspective, or perspective of learning and development. And there the perspective is how did the person who is now driving, stopping at the red traffic light, how did he or she acquire these rules, these behavioral rules? So we're looking into the past, into the individual's own history, right? And then we have the third perspective, the phylogenetic one, which is very long uh, term, consideration over generations. So how come traffic lights started to be used to regulate traffic over time? And if you want to get a complete comprehensive uh, characterization of intelligent behavior, we need to look at all the time scales. It seems to me that video conference froze and oh no, now it's working again. Okay. I hope the people in the in the virtual lecture hall can still hear me. Yeah? Yes, we can hear you, Rolf. Okay, good. Okay, now let's look at these time perspectives for understanding and design. So basically the here and now here and now perspective that we have over here. That's what's happening, the dynamical system, you know, what's taking place now. If we want to model a system at that level, we also call this state-oriented or hand design. So basically, we try to figure out what the mechanism actually is, you know, like in the Swiss robots, it's just these simple obstacle avoidance mechanisms. That's the here and now perspective. The ontogenetic perspective of learning and development, there, rather than trying to design the entire mechanisms, we design the initial conditions, the learning and developmental processes, and then we let the robot interact with the environment and acquire its own behavioral rules or its own concepts. Right? So basically, here we have more control from the designer. Here we have less control from the designer. So here there is potential for emergence, which also makes the system more adaptive. At the evolutionary scale or phylo phylogenetic perspective, we design the evolutionary algorithms and processes of morphogenesis. That is how the individual develops from a single cell into an adult organism. And if we design that, then we exert even less control over the individuals. And here in evolution, we always have a population perspective. Now, as we go along, we start with this perspective, then we move to this one, and then we discuss evolution. Right, now let's talk about emergence. I think it's an extremely important concept. And, you know, sometimes people make fun of uh, the concept of emergence because they say, well, whenever you don't understand something, you just call it emergent. But that's a ridiculous, uh, let's say, a ridiculous view because emergent behavior can be perfectly understood. So we distinguish between three kinds of emergence. We have collective behavior, global patterns, local interactions. The Swiss robots is an example, 
or a bird flock, you know, how birds fly in particular formations in the air, clapping, you know, that you go to a concert and all of a sudden people start clapping in unison. The second level is the behavior of an individual, which is emergent from the interaction with the environment. I will give an example in just a second. And emergence from time scale, which we see in a later lecture. Okay, so now let's look at uh, the uh, locomotion of biological systems. And what we have here is a robot puppy. And uh, maybe we can briefly look at the original puppy video. Nathan, can you play the video? Yeah, let's have another round there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. I think that's fine. Okay. Maybe we can switch it off. Right. Now let's let's briefly look at what's actually happening. So, the way this robot is controlled, you can see over here. So we have a leg. It has three joints. One, two, three. Now this one is the only one which is driven by a motor just oscillating, oscillating the leg back and forth. This joint and this joint, they're both passive, but they're connected. The limbs are connected by springs here. So if you put them on the ground, it's elastic, but without control. So basically, the elasticity of the spring accounts for taking care of unevenness in the ground. So we got these spring-like properties. We also call this an under-actuated system because not all the degrees of freedom, only this degree of freedom is controlled. This joint is controlled, but the other joints are not controlled. So this is called under-actuated system. We have self-stabilization. The robot is stable in its movement, but there are no sensors on the robot. So basically, it stabilizes itself, just the mechanical construction of the system. So it's as if the control were outsourcing functionality to uh, the morphological properties, the shape properties, and the material properties of the springs, for example. But we also talk about morphological computation because part of the control that will be required if we didn't have the springs is now outsourced. Uh, to the springs, and we can see a fun video now. Uh, now, Dan, can you play the, the mini dog video? Yeah. We don't know. Okay. I think it's now done. Thank you. Okay. Now we also talk of. Oh, here is a, here is basically here is basically a summary. The control is the oscillation. Uh, only the hip joints are driven, and the trajectories of the passive joints are not programmed. So we talk about exploitation of passive dynamics. So can we briefly switch to Moscow for a comment on why uh, we call this behavior emergent? Why this is emergent? Okay, do you want to give it a try? We can't hear you at the moment. I think uh, this uh, puppy's uh, construction, uh, the, the way his legs are built, make him uh, move seemingly to a real puppy. Construction okay. of uh, uh, puppy's legs. And... Uh, mm, Mm, this string that um, not uh, controlled directly um, make puppy move so naturally. Okay, I think I think it's a very good. Shape dumpster of the control program and the behavior of puppy. Maybe, uh, maybe uh, Moscow again. The relation of the control program 
you know, going back to frame of reference, what is the relation between the control um, program? And there, there is no control. Uh, uh, this puppy uh, is not controlled, and um, um, mechanism interacts with the environment and moves um, by itself. Um, Good. Okay. Right, okay, very good. So basically, the control, you say there is no control, there is definitely no feedback control. It's also what sometimes sometimes called uh, open loop control because there is no feedback in the system, but still it is stable. So the behavior, if you just look at the control program itself, you can't say very much about the behavior of the system. You really have to know how the control is embedded into the physical system, and you have to know uh, the characteristics of the environment. Okay. Now, let's look at, we have about 10 minutes left, so let's look about uh, at some of the uh, properties and principles. So I think we're okay with the theory of intelligence. We will be, uh, oh, here. Yeah, with the theory of intelligence, um, we will be using concepts from theory of dynamical systems, but we will also be using uh, formulations, verbal uh, formulations, and we will use uh, what's called design principles. And let, let's now look at some design principles, and before we do that, let's look at some properties of autonomous systems. So we have always had a complete agent that is what's called embodied, situated, autonomous, and self-sufficient. Okay, embodied is clear. It's a physical system. Situated means looking at the world from its own perspective. The ca capability of learning something about the environment from its own perspective, not being programmed by the engineer or the designer of the system. Autonomous means uh, not being directly controlled by someone else, by a human being, and self-sufficient means being able to sustain itself over extended periods of time in terms of energy and not getting damaged. Then we looked at last week we looked at real worlds versus virtual worlds i think it's very important to understand these differences you know the the virtual world which is controlled highly controlled we have a lot of information in chess for example we have complete information whereas in the virtual world everything changes dynamically information acquisition requires time and so on and so forth and then because these agents are physical systems, we can look at them at dynamical systems, which means that we can use the vocabulary of dynamical systems. Maybe we'll, I think we'll, we're coming back to that in uh, just a second. And we want to come up with, uh, with uh, design principles for intelligent systems. And just very briefly, here are the actually eight principles. We are going to look at most of them. We looked at this principle when we looked at the Swiss robots. This was mostly an illustration of cheap design that is simple mechanisms, but rather sophisticated behavior by exploiting the properties of the environment. What does that mean, exploit properties of the environment? Maybe, can we briefly switch to Zurich? What does that mean, exploit the conditions of the environment in the Swiss robot case? I didn't warn you, but maybe you can briefly comment on that. What does that mean, exploiting constraints from the environment or conditions, characteristics of the environment? Why does the Swiss robots example work? Jan, you want to uh, venture a hypothesis? I know some of the students in Zurich.
Anyone? Um, so, can you repeat the question again? Uh, okay, the question would be, we saw the example of the Swiss robots, you know, they are forming the clusters. What are the properties in the environment that they're actually exploiting? What are the properties that have to be there, are necessary um, for this simple mechanism to work? Um, the robot has the, the same dimensions as the cube. And uh, by, placing, exactly. by placing the um, sensors um, so <laughs> that it can uh, interact with the cube without getting uh, information, um, the, yep. the behavior um, emerges. Exactly. Right. That's something that's important. What if you take concrete blocks, have very heavy blocks, instead of styrofoam? What happens if you take uh, yeah, young? Or who else? Who is the? Yeah, go ahead. Now, do we move to the next question? Now, what what is your second question? Oh, the second question would be: if you take very heavy blocks, what happens? Then um, complex behavior wouldn't emerge. Um, because the environment has changed and the robot can no, no longer exploit the environment as it did before. Right, because why? If, if they're very heavy, why is that? Because, because they're the heavier than the robot. Because the dimensions of the robot do no longer match the objects. It uh, moves um, by accident. Yeah, and the, the blocks and the blocks would be too heavy to be pushed by the robot. The blo robot can no longer push the block. And third question, maybe you can also stay there. What happens if I take the walls away from the arena? And then again, the environment is changed. Um, and so, yeah. the, um, one of the preconditions to exploit um, the environment are. Um, the walls. So if you take that away, um, the robot can no longer exploit the fact that the walls are there. Exactly, because then it would just move away. So the robots would just move away and couldn't be, uh, couldn't collect the, the cubes. Okay, so that's just an illustration of these principles. Next week we will talk uh, about more of these principles. And so assignments for next week, please read chapter four in the book, How the Body Shapes the Way We Think. And please look at the reading materials for the Breitenberg vehicles. Uh, and then I would say that's, from my side, the end of lecture three. Thank you for your attention. Now we have the pleasure of two guest lectures. First, I think we have a guest lecture by Professor Vincent Miller. And then we have a second guest lecture by Professor Alex Weibel. So I suggest we take a short break. And mm -hmm. after the break, I think we start with Professor Muller from uh, Thessaloniki.